I found a river cruise is not for everyone, but it is an option for some. So let me explain who I believe it is and isn't for. This could save you a lot of money or perhaps lead you to one of your best vacations ever. If you're new here, welcome aboard. I'm Gary Bembridge and it's my goal to make it fun and easy to discover, plan and enjoy unforgettable cruise vacations. A river cruise is a great way of seeing a region in an immersive and intensive way. Whether that's Europe, Vietnam, Cambodia, the Nile or parts of the United States. But this comes with some catches. River cruises do not travel large distances across a day. Slowly they work their way along the river. When I'm on an ocean cruise, I usually travel many hundreds of miles every day and visit multiple countries. River cruises I've been on often travel just 20 to 50 miles a day, stopping frequently at places along the way and often I've called in at multiple places in one day. Unlike on an ocean cruise, river ships are always close to land. The banks are just a few meters away, so I get to observe for every minute of the cruise the landscapes, the towns, the sites, the lifestyle along the route, thus giving me a much more intensive, in-depth look at a country or a region. For example, my Rhine River cruises have explored various areas of Germany with iconic castles, historic towns and cities like Cologne, Passau, Rudersheim, Heidelberg. My classic Danube River cruises have immersed me into Austrian history, visiting places like Linz, Krems and then three capital cities, Vienna, Bratislava in Slovakia and Budapest, Hungary. When I wanted to explore French countryside and chateaus, my Loire river cruise did that for me. My Mekong river cruise showed me Vietnam and Cambodian, both rural and city life. It remains one of the most fascinating cruises I've ever done. As I said, the distances traveled on river cruises are not vast and you get to explore in a more intensive way than you would ever on an ocean cruise. Those they tend to flip quickly from place to place each day, often calling on a new country or island every single day. Broad and brief, Taste of a wide geography is what ocean cruises are much more about. But what's important to note is that river cruise programs tend to focus on four key aspects of each region, the history, religious side, culture, and food and drink. They also do it at a gentler pace once they call into a stop with panoramic bus and leisurely walking tours. Though some are now offering more active bike and hiking options. So there's some other things that you need to consider particularly this one. A river cruise is a great idea if you want to go on a vacation which is totally and utterly organized with very few decisions or options that you yourself have to juggle. All you need to do is decide when you want to go, broadly where you want to go, which cruise line you want to go with, and then everything else is done for you. The great thing about a river cruise is it's very stress and hassle free because you don't have to make lots of decisions. It's all done for you. The excursions, dining, drinks, entertainment, and so on. It's all curated and sorted. You don't have to make lots of decisions once you go on a river cruise. In my experience, river cruising is by nature much closer to an escorted tour than it is to an ocean cruise. The daily activities and program are tightly organized with no or much fewer choices than you would have on an ocean cruise, for example. It's a much more curated experience and everyone on the trip has the same shared program and experience and do the same things at the same time. You don't necessarily have to go on all the included excursions, but you should expect less choice and options and a less individually tailored cruise experience than when ocean cruising, which of course prides itself on the increasingly wide range of choice available. If having a shared communal experience with everyone on the trip and the ability to just go with the flow and not have to make decisions and wrestle with choices and options appeals, then river cruising is for you. If you like a more individually tailored, freewheeling and independent cruise experience, then consider this option much more cautiously. Unless, of course, you have the next overriding issue and concern that trumps this totally. River cruising is a great idea if you're concerned in any way about motion sickness, as it's pretty much impossible to be motion sick on a river though that too comes with a catch, as I will explain shortly. I've been on river cruises with people who get seasick at even the thought of going on a rowboat on a lake, like my father-in-law, but seriously, the chance of getting seasick on a river cruise is pretty much impossible. It's smooth sailing, literally. Your biggest water-related concern about a river cruise is not about being seasick, 
it's about water levels. And that is one of the key risks with a river cruise. There may be too much water, so the ships can't get under the bridges and therefore get trapped in a certain section of the river. Or at the other extreme, the water levels are too low and the ships can't travel further and further down the river. I've been on various cruises where both of these things has actually happened to me. For example, on one Danube cruise, we ended up only being able to travel as far as Vienna because the ships couldn't get any further down towards Budapest because of high water levels. We ended up having to go on various bust excursions because we couldn't go any further on the ship. Meanwhile, on my Mekong River cruise, the tunnel Sap Lake was too low for the ship to go, so we had to be driven many, many hours around the lake to get us to our end of cruise destination at Siem Rep to be able to visit the incredible Angkor Wat ruins. If you look online discussions about river cruises, water levels are one of the main things that has disappointed river cruise passengers because they've been stuck in one place and bust on excursions or even had to pack up and move to a different ship further up or down the river. Of course, it doesn't happen every year, but when planning, keep an eye on water levels in any season to make sure you are going to make the most of your river cruise and know what to expect. But consider, though there is another big upside, despite all of this, that may make this particular risk worthwhile. If you find big ocean ships a turnoff, or even smaller ocean ships a turnoff for that matter, river cruising is much more likely to be for you. River cruise ships will have under 200 guests on board. In fact, many will be much, much smaller and closer to 100 guests. That's certainly possible in Europe. It's true in the Mekong, going down the Mississippi or the Nile. It's a much more intimate experience. If you like the idea of traveling with much fewer people, you want to be in a much more intimate experience, this is for you. You want to get to know the passengers you're cruising with. It becomes much easier because you're mixing with the same people all the time. River cruising is then a great idea if this appeals to you. Of course, that intimate experience comes with some compromise. On a river cruise ship, you will have limited options and definitely fewer facilities. Usually there's only one restaurant and one key lounge kind of bar area. Some will have a small plunge pool, some might have a hot tub, not all will have a gym on board. You're going to have much fewer grades of cabins to choose from and so on. But you will have a much more intimate experience and you will have good food, a friendly lounge to mix with guests and a good comfortable cabin and an open sun deck to enjoy the scenery and to relax as you go cruising. If you won't miss all the bells and whistles and attractions ocean cruising serves up because a more intimate experience is more important to you, then river cruising is something that you should absolutely consider, especially if another feature of ocean cruising drives you crazy like it does me. If you're like me and want to know when you book a cruise, what it's going to cost you in its entirety and not have lots of add-ons and nickel and diming, then this could also be for you. River cruising is a much more all-inclusive experience. There are a few examples where some river cruise lines are breaking out from this, but largely speaking today, river cruising is an all-included vacation. All your food is included, all your excursions are included, Wi-Fi is included, and some or all your drinks are thrown in, and on many gratuities are also included. Transfers are also often included to and from the airport. I find it's really really difficult to spend money when I'm on board a river cruise because everything on the cruise has been covered for me. The only things that I've been out of pocket for is if I perhaps give any extra gratuities or if I bought things along the way in the various different stops that we've been on. It's important to note though that river cruising is a more expensive option per day than ocean cruising is partly because so much more is included and also it's a smaller ship. One thing to consider is as I said, most lines include excursions in the fare. And if you want to be more independent and you don't want to go on the included excursions and you want to head off out on your own, you are paying a premium for something that you will not be using. There is some hope though for you if you want to go river cruising and you're this type of traveler because some cruise lines on the rivers are moving away from this to give a slightly more fluid approach. Not many, but for example, Cross Europe is offering packages in some countries which do not include excursions, and you can then buy 
the exclusions as a package add-on or ad hoc as you want them one by one. But overall, if you'd like to know once you've paid for your vacation that everything's included, river cruising is definitely a really great option. But is it really, really limited when it comes to your various vacation options? Although on board a river cruise, there is relatively limited choice of facilities, there is a huge choice in terms of the number of rivers you can cruise on and areas of the world you can do too. And also in the number of cruise lines that you can choose to go cruising with. Europe is probably the most developed in terms of river cruising. And across continental Europe, there is an enormous, enormous choice of rivers. The most popular include the Rhine, the Rhone, the Danube, the Douro, the Seine, the Loire, the Elbe, the Moselle, Po, Volga, and on and on and on. In the United States, there's less choice with the Great Lakes area and Mississippi being the key areas. In Africa, you're gonna be able to go down the Nile and there's some limited river cruising in Southern Africa around that includes the Kariba Dam. In Asia, there is opportunities to cruise through India, the Yangtze River in China, and Vietnam and Cambodia along the Mekong. River cruising is constantly expanding and gonna be more and more places coming on board. So there is a lot of choice now and there's gonna be more choice to come. There's also an enormous range of cruise lines. The largest choice is again within Europe and there are dozens of cruise lines. Those that cater mostly for English speakers, oh, there's probably about 20 that I've counted and there may be more that I, because I've missed some. You've got everything from the ultra luxury lines like Crystal and Uniworld, five star lines like Amber Waterway, Scenic, Viking, Tauk, four star lines like Avalon, Emerald, APT, three star lines like Crossy Europe, Nico. If you're a non-English speaker and you speak French or German, you have even more choice because there are even more lines on top of that like Arosa, Colette, Crucimondo, uh, Lufna. As you can see, just so many cruise lines. If you think a river cruise is for you and want to know which cruise to start with, then watch this video where I give you the best river cruises to do and why, starting with the absolute must do first time river cruise. See you over there.